There's a massive issue here. Yeah. A fucking massive issue. I just, I'm just, I'm keen to call it out. Uh, you know, there's a lot of this stuff that goes on that is fundamentally not to the benefit of shareholders. Where it gets sticky, where it gets uh, problematic is when you have, so you have a management team who, who perhaps like board who don't own stock or a lot of stock. Maybe an MD who's on a really good wicket. And you might have a corporate suitor and, and they might be willing to pay 50, 100% premium. And you still can't get a deal done. It's like, what the fuck? What, what, what's the impediment to get there sort of thing? And then eventually it comes back to, yeah, but what about the soft issues? What does what the soft issues mean? What's that code for? Well, that's code for what about my job? It is without question the biggest issue we face is, you know, these these types of misalignments. Right up, Monday mornings today, Wednesday, 13th of September, because we won't be recording this the day before. <laughs> Boys, we had a sensational chat that's uh, been been in the bank for a bit like fine wine mate it gets better oh. the longer you wait before you you, you enjoy this one i, I think. would compare this fella to a good grange <laughs> like a good bloody grange decanted <laughs> absolutely uh his first tell all let's just uh we won't waffle too much but rusty russell delroy uh from the nero resource fund mate my okay. type of guy mm. rusty's a legend i wouldn't i wouldn't really <laughs> classify this one as a tell all it was you know, related to an issue that is very dear to, mm. to us here. It's something we speak about a lot. And I'm, yeah, I'm just really excited to share this one with the well, money it's miners. It's his first long, long interview yeah. I think he's ever done. Um, normally a pretty private, fun, private person, but uh, we've drawn the best out of him. He has some absolutely, you know, insightful views on what he and I think we kind of collectively think of as, you know, one of, if not the most um, important issue in this industry at the moment. Yeah, and an issue not spoken about enough. So it was great to, to get Rusty on the show. And he's got a mullet. He's not your <laughs> typical fund manager. He's like one of my heroes in life. Uh, mate, let's right, let's rip it. Uh, yep. Mate, sponsor for Rusty's episode, lucky sponsor. Yep. Uh, Terra, 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 Terra Capital, who are good mates with Rusty. But look, you'd put I'd put them in the band together. <laughs> of my ultimate GC fund managers that I would like to go on holidays with to an island somewhere. Yeah, so, that'd be a uh, fun holiday. But, oh, mate, hot tickets selling. <laughs> Thanks, Langers and Bondi, for all your support. And, uh, yeah, don't say this is competition against Nero or anything. Both good funds, both equally good funds. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Matty Langsford in his chat said that, you know, he's a big supporter of all the natural resources funds yeah, out there. Yeah, they're, so. all, they're all buddies. They're all buddies. <laughs> they should merge. Fund M&A. <laughs> Now, that is a whole other <laughs> bit of speculation we could yeah. talk about. When the resources market M&A dies off, we'll start speculating yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, our great friends at Anytime Exploration, Shame Smurthy, anything, anytime, anywhere, anything, people, equipment, exploration. <laughs> you want some geos to sort your bloody rocks out, give Seamus a call. Thanks, Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Righto, let's rip it with the enigmatic, mysterious mullet man, Russell Rusty Delroy. From Nero Resource Fund. Here we go. Hey, the long sleeves are back. Yeah. All the kids are wearing them. Likey's kids. Likey's kids. <laughs> <laughs> the real trendsetters. All the trendsetters. <laughs> and obviously, How come we don't have, well, I thought we'd have Froffies, Matt. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Trav's never got any bloody beer in the house. Really? Oh, that's going to change when we get the office. I've got, I've got wine. You can have a red. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? Five o'clock? <laughs> 30 p.m.? <laughs> Somewhere in the world, eh? Right on, buddy, orders. Talk about, I reckon, we've done some fucking sensational interviews in our short period in the media landscape. I'm going to put this as my... Favourite. Oh, stop it. Number one. <laughs> Number one of all time. The infamous, uh, the enigmatic, <laughs> the one and only Russell Rusty Delroy. <laughs> Number one before we've had the interview, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be. Oh, fuck, no pressure. Rip that uh, bloody mic in a bit closer, yeah, Rusty. Just so good. I, 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 I'm a virgin, be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is unfamiliar territory oh, for me. Rusty, I think, I think we need welcome. to highlight... Why, why people need to, to listen to this, guys. For the money miners out there, over 25% annualised return for over 10 years plus. Rusty focuses, he runs the Nero 
resource fund focusing obviously on the the junior and mid cap resource market it's someone like you know we've we've looked up to quite a bit in the industry doing a phenomenal job and we're going to have a awesome conversation today about in in the most boring words possible corporate governance right yeah Thank you, boys. That's, oh, a, that's a big wrap. This is your first. Best this is interview your first. ever. <laughs> this, is your first, this is your first tell-all, Rusty. Like, no, not ru- more, no, first sort uh, of long, long form of presenting yourself to the public. Yeah, I mean, so, yes, uh, you know, we've we've been, yeah, an active fund for, for 10 plus years um, and, and been closed for a lot of that for inflows. So, like, I've always had a view that... Um, media or a presence in the public domain, you know, unless there was an objective to be achieved, then why do it? It was sort of like just downside kind of thing. So but I was then like three GCs rocked up. Yeah, exactly. Well you guys you guys changed the landscape a lot. And so yeah, you know, unless we had a clear objective in mind, we always left media alone. I've got I like to think not too big an ego or anything like that to feed. So I didn't really you know, didn't need to be out there. And, um, and then, yeah, you guys came along doing something that I reckon is incredibly unique, uh, incredibly important in our sector. You know, the things that you guys talk about in a very open fashion that, you know, the conversations that I've only had with, you know, sophisticated market participants and uh, it's sort of all been, you know, behind closed doors. So I, I really rate what you guys are doing. Um, I love that these t- sorts of topics like the one we're going to talk about today are, are coming out. And um, and yeah, so as a result of that, I've been been more open to um, to, to doing things like this. We're thrilled, mate, to, yeah. to have you. <laughs> Bloody thrilled. Thank yeah. you. Now, R- Rusty JD's already given you half a wristy about your returns and, <laughs> yeah. and everything. Um, yeah. to, mm. Before we get into everything, <clears throat> tell us a bit about when the fund started. Sure. What what you're based around, what your mandates are, how's it yeah. all work? Just yeah. sum it up. For yeah, us, yeah, mate. cool. So um, headlines, uh, you know, we're boutique, deliberately so. We've been closed for quite a while. We run about 150 mil through the market. Um, we've, we've, yeah, we've we've been are uh, pretty selective about taking capital and we've taken capital on. It's typically come from the guys that were originally invested with us. So we've opened up really selectively for very smallish amounts of capital and each time the guys that are within the fund have said, we'll, we'll take all of that. So, you know, um, respect to them, they backed us, well, me when it was just me. And, so you, you, know, you started the whole thing start, started from it, small started from, yourself, from right? scratch, just myself full time and um, I think we had, Four million bucks or something after the first few months. So, um, not exactly a sustainable business model. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, re- what, what sort of options were available then when you only had four million bucks? Like the a lot different options to assume now when you got at one fifty. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I remember at the time when when the first two or three years, probably the hardest years of my life, um, starting the fund in a really difficult environment. I think the index from the starting point of the fund to the low point in the market was minus 68%, so nearly minus 70 So if on average invested, you lost 70 cents in the Outperforming dollar. Outperforming is losing less. Yeah, yeah, so we were minus 24 or something. I think I remember explaining to clients like, hey, we're doing a really good job, and they're like, oh, oh. so you, what you're telling me is you've lost less money than the next guy. Yeah. What do you want to fucking pat it on the back? <laughs> like, I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be good. Um, so, so look, it, it was really, really tough. And I remember, though, um, really distinctly, like very distinctly buying some things and Galaxy being one in particular and Lithium America's been another, buying those companies and, uh, like, just dreaming of having a bit more capital. At one point you could have bought the debt off Galaxy and and you would have circled that whole thing own, you, know, you would have taken all the equity if you really wanted to be gnarly about it and um, would have cost you like 30 million bucks. The whole company, that, would, that was at the time that included James Bay, Sal DeVita, Catlin before it had restarted. So, wow. And, and, and maybe even Jung Shu but wow. with some debt. So, yeah, yeah, it was a special time in the market. Every, every junior traded at like cash backing minus the next quarter's planned expenditure. Yeah. And I remember every broker was sort of asking me when, when are you going to convert to a tech fund and <laughs> um, no one over east would take any phone calls from numbers starting in 08. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was pretty brutal. But, um, 
but yeah, definitely like I don't regret it. It was a hugely formative part of the journey and certainly taught us to really respect capital both the capital within the business in terms of like running the business. You know, I sold my house to start it. Um, you know, I could have lost everything to make it work. And so that runway before you get to a place of profitability was really important, having to stretch that out, like every dollar counted. And then, um, and then yeah, learnings around just investment discipline and, and stuff like that. You, you couldn't afford to fuck too many things up. So, um yeah, mate, a lot, a lot of good lessons, and and I don't don't regret it at all. Did you have the mullet when you first started the nah. fund? <laughs> no, no, nah, don't Google when, any photos of me. When, <laughs> is, when did the sickening. physical brand nah, start it commencing? Was, the kids watched the mullet. It was it was <laughs> like it, a right, It was it was sickening. I had a so I've got the most punchable photo. Oh mate, we've, we've, we've looked at we, we, you Google your name and it's, it comes up with someone that doesn't look like you anymore. It's terrific. <laughs> it's terrific. And um, I'm sure I'll look back on this in ten years and say the same thing. Yeah, but, probably. But, <laughs> but nah, it was you know suit and tie. Buy a dumb watch that you think's important because people need to know that you're successful. You know, all that Perception. stuff. When yeah, yeah, when you you know, I was 30 years old. I just turned 30, and when I started the company, and um, you know, it's it's intimidating. You're trying to go out there and tell people, yeah, you're capable. Mm. I've been running money for five years for a private fund, so like a private company, and I knew I could do it. I think we'd sort of taken on about 10 or 11 million when I started, and it was worth. We'd made 35 over five years, so I was. Was confident, but um, but you know, try and explain that to people, and I, there's no sort of audited track record of that, yeah. or like it's it's hard. So yeah, you got to run with what's what's perceived as like a, the right image. But I'd say like I've had some of the shiftiest people ever wearing suits. I've had more <laughs> lies told to me by people oh, wearing totally. suits than people <laughs> totally. who are comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. So yeah, you know, for us as a firm, like our policy is is really around hopefully reasonably neat and tidy, like we're still not scruffy or messy, but be yourself. Um, and I think that's also a bit more female friendly because you know, suits are they're kind of a, for me, anyway, it's quite a masculine sort of, I don't want to go too deep and meaningful, on it, but <laughs> it, it, it's just a very stiff, prescriptive way of doing things. And, and I think most of the world's moved on from all of that stuff, finance sector, mining sector, and you know, we can talk about, Rusty Diggers and Cal and all that stuff. But um, there's one quote you told me once, which was um, nine tenths of this industry is perception, and yeah. that's stuck in my head. In fact, yeah. I think you think very thoughtfully about your perception. Yeah, no, I haven't even got black yeah. shoes on. We <laughs> <laughs> talk about female friendly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, definitely. You know, nothing's absolute, right? Like I'm a firm believer. Like people ask you, like, "What's that worth?" Well. You know, you can articulate that in many different ways. It's like nothing's absolute. Um, uh, you know, perception is reality. So you got to help shape that. I don't know what I'm really trying to shape with what I put out there <laughs> at the moment. I just, I, I just hope people recognise that I'm, I'm comfortable in my own skin. And, and like f for us as a firm, you know, it goes a lot deeper than me these days. You know, but when we started, it was just myself, but. There's some super talented people at our at our organisation. I'm really lucky to have them around me. So um, hopefully people understand that uh, we're, we're, we're good at what we do, we care about what we do, we do it the right way and we're always aligned with shareholders. It's a mm. big yeah. you know, a big part of it. When we first started the journey, there were investment banks and other groups that were sort of talking to us mm. about collaborating or having formalised relationships and stuff and... We, we very deliberately avoided that because I think the conflict of interest with ECM and, you know, taking deals and, and all of that sort of stuff mm. gets really complicated. So for us, like we've always said, we don't take fees. We don't care if we arrange a deal. We don't, you know, we'll, we'll do 20 page pitch decks on a fucking M&A piece and get paid for it. The advisor does. Mm. So, but we'll hand that over and never be conflicted and always be able to say purely to, shareholders or whomever we're having the conversation with even management hey we're here only as a shareholder it's really important and so you know, if you're going to cast aspersions as to our motivations well you know, good luck let's um let's go into that theme of alignment rusty because that's going to be the broad brush in which the rest of the conversation is is painted and it all yep. stems i think from incentives yeah 
and it, it sort of speaks to the old Charlie Munger quote that, you know, you show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. So to start this part of the, the conversation, I just want to see how, hear how you think about incentives going into an investment. When you look at companies and you're picking companies you like, how do you mm. think about incentives? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> incentive is incredibly important and, and it's hard to define like a, a, you know, hard and fast rule. But I will say that generally speaking, the more, you know, uh, management have on the line, um, they tend to be more aligned. So, you know, if they've paid for stock and they're next to you as a shareholder, your interests tend to marry with yours. When they, when they don't own stock, that can become incredibly problematic. And where I've seen that most problematic has been around uh, uh, corporate actions. So, you know, one of the things that um, yeah, we're, we're value guys. So just stepping it back for a second, we're value guys. Where, where, where do you find value? Typically it's down the curve. What's the trade-off for value? Well, it's liquidity. So you enter these sort of smaller cap stocks, try and find as advanced an asset as possible. You guys do it really well, right? Something that's tangible that you can wrap and value around. You're then looking for a catalyst, be it a commodity tailwind or a market tailwind. Great, that's easy. You get the re-rate, you get liquidity, you've got optionality. Do you want to exit? Do you want to stay, et cetera? But if that doesn't happen, you know, what are the things that you can do to catalyze value? Well, you can try and find someone um, corporately to come and, and run an action. I reckon as a fund we must have one of the highest number of corporate actions, uh, you know, across our portfolio over the 10-year journey. We had so many companies taken out. And that's part of, you know, what we do actively is to try and foster that. Um, or, or you can perhaps, you know, change management if that's an issue. And, and you know, uh, best example I could give of, of one we've been associated with would be Capricorn. You know, we ran that 249D process. We, we removed the board. It was difficult. It was not enjoyable or easy. Um, and then we spent, you know, time well, with the company, with a new board, um, finding an outcome and in the end, um, managed to attract Mark Clark and his team and, you know, goes from a 50 mil market cap to so one and a half billion today or something. So <clears throat> that's the sort of catalyst that, you, that you're looking for. Where it gets sticky, where it gets uh, problematic is when you have, say you have a management team who, who perhaps like board who don't own stock or a lot of stock, maybe an MD who's on a really good wicket and, um, and you might have a corporate suitor and, and they might be willing to pay 50, 100% premium and you still can't get a deal done. It's like, why the fuck? Can't, what, what, what's the impediment here? It's getting in the way. And, and uh, you know, not privy to all the conversations and analysis that go on behind closed doors, but I can say from experience, you know, I've had conversations with uh, guys, I won't, I won't name anyone, but guys who I know ran a big company had made a formal bid to another size company. We're talking sort of bill plus market caps, producers, you know, 100% premium type offer um, and then, you know, the, the negotiation, blah, 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 and get there sort of thing and then eventually it comes back to, yeah, but what about the soft issues? What does, what does the soft issues mean? What's that code for? Well, that's code for what about my job and... You know, the other My board bloody good salary. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you see these convoluted just clusterfuck deals where there's like nine board members and st it's just or, shit. Or the for... merger with a spin out. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's, 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 a, that's a job well, keeping exercise. You know, and being, <laughs> hey, look like, you know, sorry, being pragmatic as a, you know, as one of these people who is active in the process, sometimes you got to offer the, the carrot to guys and say like, look, you know, we can find a place for you. It, it, it. It is without question the biggest issue we face in our, you know, for us in our model, which I think is a you know, proven model, value-driven, but there to catalyse the value as well. The biggest issue we face without question is, is you know, these, these types of misalignments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, yeah, so oftentimes you find the alignment is better when those people own the stock or they've paid for the stock. And if you look at, guys like um, Chris Ellison and Minrez and 
as a, as an example, I think of of what to do and what to create and foster. That answers one of my questions for later. Yeah, because well, <laughs> well, we're going to talk. You know, we're going to talk about the I guess the the red end of the scale. If you go to the green end and talk about yeah. the example of what it is to the the top level, the bloody blue chip of yeah. shareholder alignment and incentives, and it's someone that has used ten thousand six hundred dollars to now create a multi multi billion dollar and, company and, and who and still owns nearly one and a half billion dollars of stock cash flow like an absolute beast of a company that I think the, the the I reckon it's one of the best companies in in Western Australia. Uh, and you notice way. in all his, and when he's on his calls, he always refers to it as the business. Yeah. Because it's still his business, even though it's listed on the ASX. It's still the business he started yeah. with his own money. Yeah. And he retains, what, 11% and, of and it. The, and the most amusing part, right, is like <clears throat> he, he's one of the ones I think who cops, um, you know, annually some of the most shit. So, so like the, the system, if you like, is kind of structured – to in in great, it encourages the fucking problem. So like, he cops a whack every year from the proxy advisors and all the rest of it for you know, conflict of interest because he's because he owns too much, too much. Stuff and stuff <laughs> and oh man, and like yeah. I mean, to me, that's alignment. You know, no conflict, no interest. Is that the old expression? So like, to me, like ownership is alignment. I think it's incredibly important. I think Chris is a fantastic example of how well it can work, and um, and I find it highly amusing that um, uh, pro- proxy advisors and the like take issue with it, and we get shareholder activism trying to vote it, and vote down the rem and, and stuff like that. And you know, to to our side of the fence, right? Like the fund management side of the business, and we are an investment fund, but we're very boutique, and I like to think we're do think outside the square a bit and we find that incredibly frustrating because you look at other institutions and the bigger they get, kind of the, the dumber they get. I was trying to choose better words. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of true and in, in a sense it's not necessarily the fund manager's fault, it's the structural bullshit that goes on. So when you want to access, you know, super capital or insto capital, you know, they put down this layer of, dictation as to how you got to structure things and all the rest of it. And you end up in these places where these proxy advisors play this huge role and like, you know, they're there as an independent third party analyzing management's ability and box ticking. And so for fuck's sake, come on, like, you know, one of the first things you read in any investment book is analyzing management and you're going to take some of that process away from the fund manager, the guy who's allocating the capital and like, I just find the concept just so bizarre, mm. and um, and so yeah, I, I, there's issues, there's structural issues in our industry. We've got all this capital getting sort of whirlpooled towards the index and the ETFs, you know, crowding out fees, and I feel like it's kind of dumbing capital down, mm. and and this bureaucratic sort of slavery to to the boxes that you got to tick. I, I, and I don't have all the answers. All I know is I don't want to do it myself. So. <laughs> if, you, if you flip that the other way, Rusty, is there many cases, or would you say there's more cases where there's directors that own that do own a lot of stock, but then aren't in, aligned with the shareholders because they're more aligned with themselves? Essentially, what the, you're saying the proxies are accusing Chris of, and we've uh, nah, we've, we've detailed nah. that there's not. Chris is not like that, but is there examples when it can go that way? Uh, uh, like I'm sure there's probably been um, conflicting views on what best to do with a company between, a, a, you know, a, an outside shareholder and say a, a share, shareholder slash manager. Um, but no, nah, not in, you know, in small caps, I can't think of any. The, the more times the guys that run it own it. The, the more aligned we find they are. And pro- Bill, Bill's probably a good mandate for that as well. Bill's a what great he's example. Doing, yep. doing with develop. It's very like he's talking about the business model being very similar to MinRes, but it's it, his shareholding is also very similar as well. He's hundred percent very aligned. Alignment's massive. I mean, look at Clarkie, look at Rao, look at Bill. Yeah, they all own big chunks of their their companies. You know, you're in the hands of guys who know what they're doing, and they're super aligned and motivated. 
So, you know, those things, they're all big, um, big components for us. Having said that, like, you know, it doesn't, most aren't like that. So it's not, it's not like you can have these, when we talk about like rules of investing or, or whatever, you can't be too, can't adhere to it too much. Because if you did, you'd just miss so much in the landscape. The universe is a tiny number of companies you can choose from. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so what you end up doing is, well, for us anyways, what we end up doing is, is being uh, comfortable to play a more active role and, you know, and, and if we have to go through unfortunate um, processes like the, the one we're going through at the moment, then, then you know, we will. And um, we feel very clean and pure in our intent, you know, we're there for shareholders. We're there to generate outcomes for shareholders, and we're one of them. And so we're really aligned and motivated, and um, and uh, perhaps sometimes the the management of the companies that we're talking to are, are not so aligned and motivated. I, I'll give you an example, a, a really good one. Yeah, it was a small cap company. It was uh, maybe a year or two into starting the fund, so we were you know little, didn't have brand or, or anything like that to sort of rely on. We'd, we'd bought 4 or 5% of this company, uh, I won't name it, and it was trading, you know, I think, 60 cents in the dollar on cash. So it was 20-odd million in cash. It was like a 12 or $30 million market cap or something like that. Um, they had an asset base. We, 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 we said to them, hey, we think you need to concentrate on this asset. But market is just horrific at the moment. So conserve capital, you've got three senior guys here, you're not really progressing anything at the moment. We think you need to rationalise it, we think you need to rationalise wages, et cetera, and, you know, hunt an asset. And when you find the right one, get after it. And if it's within your stable, then, you know, work those up further to a point where you're confident to get after it. Had this, like, circular conversation for, like, two hours with the managing director. And, you know, it wouldn't have been easy for him listening to this punk kid sit across the table and say, I want you to have your wage or whatever. So I, I respect that. I understand it. But ultimately my job is to generate returns for my investors and for shareholders next to us. And I felt like I was advocating things that would help with that. And, um, and at the end of it, he, he got to a point and it was almost like it was very emotional. And he was like, look, mate, fuck. I'll just level with you, all right? If I halve my salary, my wife is going to fucking divorce me, right? And I'll tell you why. Because I can't afford to send my two girls to private school. That is my reality. The uh, soft issues. The soft issues. And uh, admittedly, you know, that wasn't too soft for him. That was pretty friggin' pertinent. So I, I appreciated his honesty. It took two hours of stuff to get there. But, but unfortunately, the, the, the sad reality of that is that is not your fiduciary duty, right? So that is just fundamentally not ever to come into the equation for you when you're thinking about how best to, to manage the company. You know what we need? We need another plant. So, <laughs> well, maybe that, that, there's one between two ferns. Yeah. <laughs> so, mate, let's say, um, you know, you raised the point about you know, fiduciary duties. Of, uh, of, of directors and I think like if you look at the, the fiduciary duty of a director in general it means the responsibility of directors to act honestly and in good faith and to the best of their ability in the best interest of the organization or company is that enough mm, um, well yes I mean by 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 the letter of the law yes so as long as it is upheld then I, I would argue you know that's pretty feels to me like a pretty firm definition um, and it covers a fair fair amount of stuff there that's that's pretty solid. The question is who polices it? Like, you know, they're not acting within their fiduciary duty. And the reality is that, like, you know, it's very hard for the regulator. So I'm not here to in any way throw stones at the regulator. I think it's a really difficult area. It's it's like um you know, like we're talking about valuations and stuff. It's not necessarily absolute, like it's you know, it's a matter of, of, of a viewpoint perhaps in some instances. So, so what does that mean? Well, um, it really comes down to like to, to shareholders giving a fuck and, and, and institutions giving a fuck. And too many times I think instos, you know, when they come down the curve, it's not, they're not meaningful positions in the portfolio, so they're easy to clip and not care. 
And I think more often than not, you know, nine out of 10 times, company goes the wrong way. They're not happy. They just exit. And, you know, I'm not saying like we, we stick around for every problem child, but, um, but certainly when, you know, <clears throat> when there's value there and it's really, really clear, then, then for us and our business model, and, and hopefully, um, you know, I think we're seeing a few more institutions emerge who, who share a, a similar viewpoint to the way we perhaps think about things. You know, get in there, roll your sleeves up. First of all, work as proactively with the company as possible. That's always, 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 always our first port of call. You know, work with them, help them. Uh, and, and, you know, if you get to a point where you, where you feel that that's no longer a, you know, there's just a, a fundamental difference of opinion perhaps, then, then, then you might say, well, hey, look, you know, I think we should have a, a board seat or, or perhaps, perhaps it's better if we change the board out with a refresh altogether. <clears throat> and then, and then you've got a process, you know, you got, you got some choices to make. And, and that's where I think if you were going to change things, I think that's where things could change because, you know, groups that then make the effort to go to, I'd say a 249 and, and run a process, put forward a board, um, speak to shareholders. There's a lot of effort in that. So bear in mind, like for Capricorn, we owned three or 4% of the company by getting involved in that manner, it ended up like making it even more difficult for us to participate in the capital raises and, and stuff. So it was like more obligation on us. So we were like carrying the load with no real benefit other than the, the, the three or four percent of the company that we owned. I feel like that's a, a you know an outsized amount of effort that goes to everybody's benefit in the end. You know, as I said, fifty mil to one and a half mil. So, so I feel like. I'm happy to take that on. We're happy to take that on. Where I get frustrated is, um, you know, the way the system works, it's very stacked against you. So incumbency, the directors that are incumbent, even if they don't own the stock, there's so much advantage to them. They have a full list of all shareholders. You know, they can be difficult in giving you that. Um, technically, you're supposed to be able to get it, but privacy or... Put it this way, they've just got a lot better reach. They use your capital. So ironically, it's probably capital that you've provided in a capital raise that they'll then use to defend their position against, you know, someone that you feel would better manage the company. So they're using your money to fight you and they're funding not just lawyers and making it legally different, uh, difficult, but, um, but also, you know, things like proxy whisperers where they will, they pay a third party, it might be 50, 100 grand. It's not, not nothing money. And they'll go and pay a third party with your capital to then rustle up, you know, all the, the small shareholders and, and ring the, you know, the, the, the grannies and the, 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 the mums and dads who might not know much about it, give them a very one-sided view of the matter at hand and say, oh, would you mind just, you know, logging on here? Let me help you guide you through that. And yep, yep, yep. Now you just say yes, yes, no, no, here on the votes. And like, I reckon that's pretty insipid. I, I reckon there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And um, I think the analogy I put to it in the deleted episode was paying, so, paying someone to have sex with your partner. <laughs> you did, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, more diplomatic I said at this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I, I know that. We can always rely on, on you, Matt, to find a way to express it that, that, <laughs> that everybody can relate to. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's very frustrating. Like I feel like, you know, we really enter these things, as I said, um, quite purely. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying we're always going to get it right. I'm not necessarily saying we're the smartest guys in the room. But, but we're there with a view for the right reasons. We're there to get value to shareholders, right? An outcome to shareholders. That is it. And I feel, I get really frustrated by the fact that, you know, incumbent directors who I think might be there just protecting a wage or a, and even sometimes just a relevance, like people who might be a bit, bit older and they're like, you know, but you kick me off this board. Well, I can't get another one. You know, like there's, there's, can we, te can we tease out the whole process? So like everything from the section 249D, which is where there's, I think our listeners would benefit from the, like 
knowing the mechanisms in which the shareholders can actually try and create some action mm-hmm. and then the barriers that they face, if we sort of yeah. break it down a little bit, maybe starting with the, the section 249D, which is this um, yep. you know, section of the corporation. Leave so, it for the shareholders. The, the, yeah. <laughs> so, so, the smoke and gun. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think it's designed, so I, I'm sure a lawyer can give you a, a way better you know, explanation. You'd be than pretty I, than up I on them these days, wouldn't you? Oh, I speak to a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so uh, I think it's designed such that, you know, you can't just do frivolous things. I think that's why the 5% hurdles there. So to, to be clear, to, to launch a 249, you have to speak for 5% or more of the company. You either hold that yourself or you can choose to join with other shareholders in a formal manner. Um, a notification goes as a joint shareholding, and then you and then you combine that interest, and as a result, you go over five percent. Then you can um, commence a, a two four nine day process and and take it to a to a, a meeting um, or a shareholder vote, right? As to who should come on and who should go off, and all of that sort of thing. So, I, I, like, you could lower that that hurdle, maybe, but. Um, would you end up with like a lot of frivolous stuff where just yeah. anybody does it? Maybe you would. So I kind of understand you should have some level of uh, ownership that doesn't, you know, up front thinks that this is a, you know, that something needs to be changed. So I kind of understand that. You, 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 you either buy your 5% or you collaborate with others. You then commence, you know, work with your lawyers, commence a process. Um, and then I think it's six weeks from memory. Like yeah, that. I think you have, you know, 21 days the, the directors have and then within two months uh, a meeting has to be yeah. has to be called. And to be clear, it's not just to renew the board. There are a couple other, you know, actions that can be taken, but when we talk about a, a Section 249D, it's yeah. far and away the most dominant sort of... A, a meeting use. is penned to, to vote on resolutions, which are typically yep. replacing the board members, but the board of course, we want to defend this and they're going to make, the, the board are going to make recommendations to all shareholders to vote against these resolutions. They exactly. So they will work with lawyers, work with media. So you, again, use your capital in the media to go and promote their own interests. They'll then work with proxy whispers. And yes, they will also have the massive benefit of the chairman's vote. So, you know, how many people? I mean, it's a, it's a lot. Just get their voting slip and go. Yeah, we, you know, to the chair. It's just such a default thing that people do. So they get this like level of incumbent support through no result of good management or anything like that. It's just, uh, I don't know, part of the system. And again, that ties in with proxy whispering and and ringing people up. Oh, would you mind just just tick that one box? Very easy. Tick the one box to the chair. And then, yeah, the chair just votes in his own people. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, it's a mountain to climb. You know, there's a, there's a, I remember I spoke to a group maybe five or six years ago who specialised in advisory around this stuff. And they said to me, mate, Rusty, love what you're doing, but, you know, we only really work with, um, with the, the, the incumbent boards. Too hard doing what you're doing. We, we, we don't work with guys like you. Um, but good luck. But yeah, yeah, good best luck, of luck mate. Yeah, um, crusade. Yeah, yeah, good luck. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, I like, look, and, and to be, I want to be really clear as well. We do these things very rarely, right? So it's an absolute last resort. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to get a whole bunch of stuff out there saying that we're activists and stuff. Now, I've always said we're active, not activists. That might be being a bit cute, but that's how I, I think about it. We do a whole bunch of active things, try and help the company realise value for shareholders. And if we get to a point where we can't go any further, then yes, we are prepared to go to activism. And I think we've been associated now with, you know, this is our second before nine. So we're not doing them all the time. Very au fait with how they work. We've voted in, in a few of them. Um, the what the... They're very rarely successful, right? So I think yeah. it's a, it's a, yeah. they're very, like, there's a stupidly rare statistic about how many are actually successful. And um, it's, yeah. there's a few factors that make them rarely successful. One of them is the, the fact that um, very few people actually turn out to vote. Yeah. And another one is the dynamics at hand in the way that 
proxy advisors have an influence on the voting of passive institutions, which make up a significant portion of the register, and they always vote. Almost always. Proxy, you got to get to the proxy advisor almost like the day you launch it or something like that. So you got proxy whisperers, proxy advisors. Yeah, you got you know, you got the chairman's cast um, uh, proxy. <laughs> yeah, you got it, it. Yeah, it's it's fucking hard. Like they're not easy to take on. I would argue that they are. Um, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be so stacked against you as a shareholder. I I, I don't have all the solutions as to to what it is that you change, but I think using capital in in egregious ways like proxy whispering. Mm. You could definitely tighten up some rules and regs around that. Let's talk about proxy whispering, right? Yeah, one more. I'd love to just frame what Trav touched on in a, in another light. Do you think mm. passive institutions should be taking on more responsibility in, mm. in how they go about these things? They, like mm. we just said, they almost always take the vote of the advisor. Yeah, and the, and the advisor, um, their default position is to defend an incumbent board. It needs to yeah. be an incredibly sophisticated campaign in order to have a proxy advisor yeah, and actually given, recommend a new board. <laughs> and you usually have 30% turnout of shareholders, maybe 35% of the shareholders go and actually vote. So yeah. you can get the institutions if it's, you know, mm. less likely in the very small end of town, but yeah. in mid caps, if you can get the institutions on board, plus you've got the, the board and friends of the, the board, you know, like there's. Well, well, yeah, where it's getting increasingly more complicated and I think where you're going is, is things like ETFs. Right? Yeah. So the ETFs will almost always yep. revert to the um, proxy advisor, and the ETFs are not small, right? They might be the largest Massive. shareholder in in a yep. lot of these, like Gold Coast, for instance. And combined, you know, if there's multiple yeah passive funds, and we started to see them take more active positions in in relation to ESG, you know, BlackRock and Larry Fink and the like, they were, you know, getting a lot of press for yep. you know starting to make their own decisions on you know, particular issues. So, yeah. you know, could we see them take more of a, you know, active approach in thinking about oh, what the situation is at hand? hundred percent. I yeah. mean, it's a, this sort of inertia and, and um, yeah, all care, no responsibility type of thing. It's, it's yeah, it's, it, it's a problem for sure. And that's like, <clears throat> that's not saying the regulator or, or, you know, the rule book can fix. Yeah. That's industry, right? That's, that's, that's us talking on platforms like this. That's that's you know uh, um, industry players advocating to say, hey, you know, you got to think about this a bit more. Like the the current default position, it doesn't work, and and we're going to end up with more of these problems. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, I, I fundamentally do think it has to change. It, it, I, I hope it does. I don't, I don't know that it will. Mm. But yes, agreed. These um the the proxy whisperers they probably don't like us using that word the proxy solicitation firms. Mm-hmm. The, these Is that are the official name for them? Yeah, proxy. Yeah, yeah. Who started proxy whisperer? Now who that? that's stuck like <laughs> shit, hasn't it? It is in our heads at least. <laughs> but they're proxy solicitation firms. It's a good. They're they're these firms which are hired <clears throat> by the incumbent board. Typically, yes. You can, it's nothing to stop you yeah, hiring typically. yourself. But they, 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 they typically hire. But, I mean, yeah, so yeah. let's think about that. Let's say both sides hire one. Now, I'm a 5% shareholder. I've called a meeting. I've got to fund that whole cost off my own bat for, for my 5% interest, right? Yeah. The board, they don't fund that stuff themselves. The company treasury pays for that, right? Like that, that in itself is egregious. So, I, I, you know... So they're using they're using the capital that was tipped in in a capital raise. You probably the share, provided the them. share. The shareholders are saying, "Hey, you're probably not using my money the way I want you to." So I'm trying to spill the board, and then in order to prevent you from ousting them, they're actually using your capital to hire firms to help defend you from spilling them. <laughs> and so that's why it's so bad. In, Spot on. <laughs> so bad in in the natural resource world, and we see it less with founder led companies like we touched on, you know, with, with yeah. MinRes and stuff. Yeah. Because these are capital hungry businesses. They have directors that float around then come into the company, they haven't founded the company and have a substantial stake. You see it much less with those founder-led businesses, right? Oh, 100%. And, and, and a lot of the problem people in the, in the sector, these people tend to float from company to company. Um, they build out CVs that 
Oh, I don't think largely reflect any actual delivery of anything. They just hop across to different boards and maybe you get me on your board and I get you on my <laughs> board and I'll, I'll introduce you to bugger lugs over there. And, yeah. You know, there's this whole sort of clubbiness to it, which I don't think is anything to do with delivery. And they go and, you know, again, some weak board that third parties everything goes to some firm that, you know, advises them on a hiring uh, process for another board member and it all gets boxes ticked and this person's CV's checked out because they've been on this board and this board and this board. But what the fuck did they actually do? What, what did they actually deliver on those? None of that's brought into question. It's just very bureaucratic and circular. There's a lot of sort of uh, back scratchings, maybe not the right way, but there's a lot of codependency here. So the same board members that might hire the firm that does the independent review, yeah, they're all known to one another. They're all like, oh, well, maybe I'll get another job doing the, the next board appointment. <laughs> re, re, um, <laughs> repeat business. Repeat business, 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah, mate, mate. Oh, actually, I've got a great role for you on this other one as well. So, yeah, you know, another even one these, coming up in 12 months. Correct, even these independent. Um, <laughs> independent expert. <laughs> expert. I just, I'm just I'm keen to call it out, uh, you know. There's a lot of this stuff that goes on that is fundamentally not to the benefit of shareholders and, and yeah, that's my view. And, look, you know, I'm not here to kill off um, board members getting incentives. I want to see them get incentivized. I want to see them get stock. I want to see them making money. I want us all to make money collectively. Um, I think if, if you've got things that are performance-oriented, you take it to shareholders and they Give the shareholders some power. Let them vote on things or approve things. Um, this idea that things are sort of you know done with third parties and um, you know are they really independent when they're? I would say they're codependent. A lot of this shit. So. We do really get into the the hypocrisy of the the whole debate here when you come as a shareholder with five plus percent and you're being counted by a board who have you know, a lot of incumbent power, but between the board that, you know, it's say in 95% of the times they hold less of a percentage ownership in the business than the, the sort of revolting shareholders, right? Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So Capricorn, we had a board who owned hardly anything really yep. from memory. Um, it's almost like zero. Mm. It was less than 1%. From memory, I memory, don't, don't. Yeah, help me to I mean, account on that. And then, and then we had, this was a really interesting set of circumstances. We had a PE group there with 20% yeah. who voted against us. And, to, and why? Like why, why vote against us? Well, maybe it worked for them having the incumbent yeah. board there. And maybe, um, you know, maybe they felt that worked in their interests. Mm. So, you know, we had to fight that 20% hurdle. And, yeah, to your point earlier about what's the average turnout, out, I think it's around about 40 is, is yeah, okay. the average. And um, so they already had the vote on average, right? They, they mm, you know. You got 20 there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you, you, you try yeah. and take on a 20% interest, yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's a, yeah, it's a process, right? So that, that wasn't easy. Um, we had to do a lot of, yeah, have a lot of conversations and, and, and stuff with individual shareholders and, um and and to you know to 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 be fair to that twenty percent shareholder in the end you know they understood what we what we were trying to do after a while and um yeah that was a process but but we got there and and look <clears throat> I think it I think it validates from my point of view anyway us as a as a as a as a group that people should look to work with and if you see us on a process then you know. My, my phone's always open. I would hope that we attract um, capital. I would hope that we attract institutions. I would hope that we attract high net worths and, and family offices and, and retail. And I hope these pe people out there in the in the industry and the guys that you guys connect with actually sort of follow and, and check out what we're doing. And when we run these actions, maybe, yeah, get in touch and um, let us put our case forward and um, get around it because I, I think – these are great opportunities to, to, to extract value often. Yeah. There's, so. there's another fascinating layer to this, which I, I think, you know, a lot of the money miners listening might not totally appreciate, but you, you know, you've started what's now an institutional 
investor, yet you have the same problems. And a lot of small individual shareholders will have gripes saying, you know, the, the power is all against the individual shareholders. But it's interesting to hear, and I'm not sure if there's a pointed question at all, but that institutions have the, have the same problems, you know. It's not just the small shareholders. It's really yeah. often the, the board against yeah. the rest. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, we're all Robin Hood. Yeah. So we're all trying to take on uh, Goliath. Well, mm. you know, the board is Goliath. No matter yeah. whether they own stock or not, there's a lot of uh, incumbent advantage to them. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I, yeah, we're right next to the retail. Guy. It's fucking hard. Like these, these things are really hard, really time consuming, really headspace consuming. And, um, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, you got to make sure that the size of the prize kind of justifies it. And that's unfortunate because that means that, like, a lot of stuff you just walk past and you go, oh, fuck, it's just too hard. The rules are just too hard. Mm. You know, so. All right, the amount of cleanup that could go on in our sector is massive. And I think there was, I don't know if it was on your podcast or, or, or another, but it might have been Rick Rule coming out with some comments recently about the number of companies on the TSX and dropping a digit or two off that. Would make some, yeah, that's <laughs> like, like there shouldn't be. And, and I've said this to so many small caps, you know, we're here to see less small caps, not more. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be IPOs and, and new companies and, and assets brought to market, of course, but in general, there's a lot of things that should be consolidated. It's crazy how disparate a lot of assets are out there and, you know, the gold sector and, I mean, the whole resources sector really. And um, it, 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 I think you guys have touched on this issue a few times. As a result of that, you know, as a result of, I would say, vested interests or soft issues getting in the way of fucking common sense consolidation, um, a whole heap of cal- capital gets poorly allocated and wasted. Um, you know, yeah. And, and so <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a good point, Rusty, to sort of talk about the solutions. And, um, yeah. and this is a big caveat because we don't have, we don't really have it any, but like, yeah, I mean, like, like granted, this is an, an issue that has outsized impact on our industry, the mm. one that we love. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, are there lessons we can learn from from other industries or, you know, are there actions that we can take to sort of, you know, m- mitigate the negative impact that this has to shareholders? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think returning things to shareholder votes wherever possible, you know, um, performance shares and the like, those sorts of things, just as a default, I think that would be good. I have no problem, again, with, with performance shares. I, I advocate for them. And if, and if the board has delivered or, or sacrificed or, you know, there's a good justification for something and the shareholders endorse it, then, then it, there should be a level of, of, of scrutiny and control over that. Um, perhaps that's a, a solution. Having said that, it's no good creating incentives and then having them voted down if someone's actually met the hurdles, you know. So, yeah, there's trade-offs to that sort of thing. Um, One of the things we got loud about on the podcast was a certain lithium developer, the managing director, uh, just giving himself 10 million free shares retroactively, you know, completely separate to any performance, um, you know, criteria or anything that we've met before. It was just a retroactive yeah. bit of uh, approval. and it. But it got voted up, through. Got voted through 53%. You know, it was... Um, he got his shares. He got his shares. If it went to a vote, yeah. you know what? I, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Um, I know that might sound a bit harsh, but yeah. I think, I think it's pretty punchy to, to just carte blanche retrospectively sort of say, I'd like some more mm. stock or whatever. But look, you know, if it went to a vote, mm. uh, you can't be any fairer than that. D- democracy is democracy arm. Um, not always enthused by who gets voted in to run the country or the state either, but, mm. um, you know, you respect it, 100% respect it. So I think if it's democratic, that's as kind of as pure as you can get. I, I don't know if there's... Is, yeah. it, is it important to have greater voter turnout? Like, you know, we as shareholders, yes. you know, yeah. who own a paisley yeah. amount of shares sort of need to be a bit more proactive about the fact there's an EGM scheduled and... But you go on, click the link and put in your hint and then actually go through the resolutions one by one well, and click yes, no. Yeah, no, nah, <laughs> nah, yeah. I think that's a great area to concentrate on. I'm, I'm 
glad you've raised that. And um, yes, there could be a lot more uh, requirement around that interface. Um, you know, the, the, in terms of nefarious behaviour by <laughs> by by boards in like you know how they count votes and the votes get disqualified because the eight on the on the date looks like a nine and it's not the ninth or you know like. Do you know, like those sorts of things. Yeah, I've heard lots of stories. I'm not going to, not going to say anything, but I've uh, heard lots of stories about how this sort of stuff can go down. And 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 yeah, that, you know, some scrutiny on those things would, I think, be welcome as well. But absolutely, anything we can do to encourage people to, to to vote. Any sort of, I, I, one thing I would say, like, absolutely could improve immediately without much effort. And the ASX could play a really big role in this, the platform. I, I feel like, you know, democracy works when everybody has platform to, to put their view forward. And when you look at a 249D, that's a democratic process. The, the, the platform is, again, stacked against you as a, as a requisition. You know, the company owns the platform. Right, so when 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 announcements, company announcements go to the ASX, they own that interface, right? And again, best that you get a lawyer on here to talk to the exact, you know, what you can and can't do. I always ask whenever I'm engaged in a process, but you know, it's pretty limited. Like your ability to make a statement when you start the action is sort of there, but then like you don't, you know, there needs to be more. You need to have more ability to put things up on a platform and advocate your your side of the equation and i think that ability to interface with with shareholders and advocate that could improve dramatically interesting it's interesting you mentioned that because where you see some of the shareholders who have an issue organize themselves is places like copper yeah <laughs> um, and may, maybe to degrees because yeah like shareholders don't have a voice on the platform mm -hmm. <laughs> absent you know lodging a change of substantial notice or something like that. But um, we saw yeah. some, we saw some pretty concerning stuff coming out the back of COVID as well. Not exactly related to voting, but a lot of companies doing these AGMs and meetings online and then wanting to maintain doing it online. So they can't get questioned and all these sorts of things, you know, face to face. Cause if it's behind, you know, if it's a virtual AGM, you can click no to the questions and oh, stuff. Like oh, it's me. exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, in the, in the broader conversation, Super important, I think. I heard heaps of cynicism around digitising this stuff. And, yep. and that, you know, I'm very happy we, we live in a country where we still vote on a piece of paper. I know yep. it seems pretty pretty agricultural, but I think there's just an inherent amount of you can always go check that, right? You keep it somewhere, you store it somewhere, you can you can audit it. I think digital, uh, yeah, I got, yeah, I think it's problematic. Definitely on voting mm. and definitely on... Um, uh, yeah, meetings. They yeah. Say should be having face-to-face -face meetings. Agreed. Yeah. I've got one more question on potential solutions, and I've, I've got an opinion, but I'm, I'm keen to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. Do you think giving ASIC or, the, you know, the regulator more tools, whether that's more cash and stuff, actually fixes a problem here? Oh, man. Um, I don't even know what the budget is. I know. Yeah. I, 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 I but it's just so hard with all of these soft issues and all these other things that we're talking about. I feel about, like it pro not... probably does help. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I know that sounds simplistic, but, you know, I do feel for the, for the regulator and I do feel for the exchange. We have an enormously deep market in terms of the number of companies, yep. or, or maybe that's breadth, maybe I'm good there, but we've got a lot of companies here, right, like a lot. And I'm very proud whenever I go anywhere globally to say, hey, WA – you know, Australia and not just Australia, but WA Perth is the epicenter of small cap mining globally. You know, there are so many small caps here, so many juniors, so much uh, capital, so much risk appetite, um, entrepreneurialism, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, uh, what do they call it? The um, uh, animal spirit, those things. <laughs> so I love that, right? I love it. I, I love that. And, yeah. and, um, uh, maybe these companies all chip in a bit more for that big pool of fun to to counter the director's bias when it comes to 2490s yeah. and to, to go into the a bit more funding or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we, we want, we want, 
a deep and rich industry. I mean, I did say a minute ago we want less small companies. <laughs> I want more consolidation. I still want yeah. more new companies coming through the pipeline, right? Yeah. Um, and and so we want that. We want a regulator and an exchange that is well funded to to help manage that because it is you know it is a task. There's a lot of shit going on every day. I mean, you guys know that because you yeah we've got to cover it all. pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, it's it's busy out there, right? So yeah. imagine trying to regulate that on the hop. Uh, yeah. and mate, we put a filter on like market cap size and I feel like the real crappy stuff happens, you know, below our filter. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So look, I mean, I, I do feel for the, for the regulator. I do think, so if you step where it, like, and I do think funding plays a role here from government because if you step back through it and you go, hey, you can't just make listing more expensive because that's prohibitive to getting more of these companies out of the ground and money into the ground. You know, you want that capital going into the ground. So you can't just make it more expensive to list. You, you therefore want some, you know, government assistance or, or whatever it is to help fund um, regulation and, and oversight and, uh, and the like. Um, because, and I think you can justify it, because the value creation, I mean, look at Fortescue. Like that thing was a shell co. Like that is that is the living proof of, and you know I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> put that to the side. There's, like, there's, lots of, there's a few stones you can throw there as well. But but, yeah. the, but it, as a, as a you know as a company as an example of what you can create from a, from a shell vehicle. Yep. It, it's it's phenomenal, right? So like, you know, we want more of that, and I think the government sees so much benefit in terms of the tax take, the royalty take, the employment. Um, infrastructure, um, securing the north. You know, there's all sorts of topics and go into that I feel very passionate about that the mining sector brings, and it brings it through this this um, attracting capital and and risk. You know, so those things we've got to absolutely foster, and and I feel like if we've got a well funded um, regulator making sure that's all done in in fair ways and that the shareholders are looked after, because what will happen is if 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 boards and and the like keep fucking shareholders over, then Eventually, capital gets fatigued. Yeah, and it'll it'll go elsewhere. Yeah, so it's really important to get it right. It's really important to make not make it like prohibitively expensive. So yeah, funding. Sorry, long winded answer. Mm. No, no, loved yeah. it. And I think if if a, a, a goal of mine is um to to one day use the use the podcast to maybe encourage shareholders to think deeply about a board recommendation, and, and hopefully, if it's one where it's pretty clear, um it's in their best interest to vote against the board recommendation and it actually gets over the line. That's like going to be like my real, I'm going to feel good about this podcast if that happens one day. So yeah, I nice. can stay tuned, mate. We'll, we'll keep using the potty for a bit of shareholder activism too. I think there's a reason that, you know, the shareholder activism space is a lot more you know, developed and sophisticated and prevalent in the United States. And it's, it's to do with the protections around free speech. There's a massive issue here. Yeah. A fucking massive issue. You know, it is, it, it goes to the core of a lot of, a lot of topics well beyond you know, <laughs> mining and investing. Um, it, it's a big, big issue. But what you guys are doing is just so fundamentally important. Like, and having a platform and having an opinion, right? Like people, you know, it's a contest of ideas. I look at a 249 as the same thing. It's not, as I said at the start when we were talking about, you know, our investment thesis and stuff, like that, there are no absolutes in the world. Anyone who tells you it's black and white on any topic whatsoever like it, it's not. There's. I don't want to get too deep. I mean, we can question reality. There's a, there, no one knows anything. There, there, there are there are just viewpoints and ways of articulating viewpoints. And so, you know, I think the contest of ideas is one that's fundamentally important. You know, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Elon Musk and what he's doing around this. I don't have to agree with everything he says, but I do agree with his right to say it, and I think that's his point too. Like. Get out there, talk about it. If you're wrong and you're talking shit, you'll get found out. Like, you, you know, opening up platforms like this and, and, and other conversations, that exposes people. That's the only way to do it. Having some, you know, central decision making on what's truth or, you know, what hurts someone's feelings or this sort of stuff, I think it's, it's really dangerous. So, you know, um, go, 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 go. Jump on Netflix, check out a, a, a do documentary or two on on the Nazi Party and, and on propaganda and how that 
how that slow erosion of um of free speech occurs. And I know that's a very extreme example, so you know I, I appreciate I'm probably getting shit for that too. But um, but but it, it it's a fascinating case study, and and it was it was slow. Right? This didn't happen overnight. They didn't all just suddenly subscribe to to see kale, you know, because it was you know, the cool thing to do. This was a very, very slow and methodical erosion of freedom of speech and then, uh, you know, um, uh, creating and doctoring of narratives. And Anyway, these are very broad topics. Very <laughs> well, well off, buddy. Yeah, um, it's fascinating. Small cap mining and stuff. But, but you know, it's relevant. You know, yeah. We're all humans. We're all here to live good lives. Um, uh, you know, give it our best shot. We're all going to make mistakes. We're going to fuck things up. But let's just have open conversations about it. Let's let's make sure that's a fundamental pillar of everything we do. And let's hope we can keep providing something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's why so I'm here, boys, because I love that you're doing it. I think it's fucking awesome. I know it's a bit of a circle jerk, but um, <laughs> but, but I, I do. I I just fucking love it. And um, yeah, long may it continue, <laughs> long and loud. We appreciate it, mate. We um, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. But I think there's a few more conversations we'd love to have with you to you know maybe go a bit deeper at, at a later time on um on a, on a few a few things you know not notwithstanding your, your journey with with Nero and maybe do a, a bit of a bit of bit of a, a an interview to see how you view the world of investing that's separate yeah. to activism because um yeah 25 yeah, yeah, percent yeah. compounded return is pretty damn impressive so yeah no there, there must uh, be there must be some secrets uh, to that alpha uh, I'd, I'd, <laughs> yeah no i'd love to do that I'd, I'd really appreciate it and um yeah it's a bit of a shame that sort of my first interaction in this format is, <laughs> is, is, is about some pretty punchy stuff and um, I, I, you know, I'm conscious that I'll probably get a brand as a, as an activist and, and whatever, but I embrace it, mate. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, why not? Um, but, but yeah, no, nah, I mean, you know, it, yeah, investing is something that I, I absolutely love. Like I froth, froth this industry, froth the space, froth the characters. I, I, I love the sector and, um, always happy to talk about it. And as I said, there's no absolutes. I don't have all the answers or all the rule books. I'm not going to go write a fucking book. Um, I think it's it's an, it's you know something that you, if you're constantly evolving, so it should always be interesting to hear from people who are doing it because I think if you're doing it well, you're constantly changing and 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 evolving. And I reckon the day that you turn around, you go, I know what I'm doing now, then you should that's you done. Mm. Beautiful. I appreciate your time, Rusty. Cool. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, boys. Who do Who do Oh, boys. Boys, done done well after I left. Uh, I had to, did have a game of golf there, um, as you've probably seen from the wide shot. But, um, mate, very um, – the I saw it as a privilege that he'd never done one before and we had the opportunity to really delve into his – mate, because, mate, as JD mentioned at the start, fucking impressive returns year on year. Um, love it. Yeah, it's Love not it. an open and closed conversation. This one, this one is something we're going to keep talking about. It's an, mm. you know, it's an issue that's obviously prevalent in in our industry, and we want to do what we can to address it. Imagine what you're going to be like when you got shitloads of cash, Trav. Fuck. Uh, I'll probably still be the prick I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but it'll be heightened. <laughs> right, beauty. Thanks to all the partners, Terra, and uh, anytime mentioned at the top of the show, Smack. K Drill and JP Search. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Bloody love it. Right, I heard a room, Money Mine. It's heard a room. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation, and needs.